All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. It's great to see you all. Welcome back. Um, so tonight we're going to dive into a new sutta. We're going to dive into a new teaching. Um, so last week we did the All the Roots, the Roots of All Things Sutta, and that was part two. We spent two weeks on that. I was tempted to do a third week on it because we didn't really get all the way kind of through it. But I decided, you know, let's leave that sutra in in the past for now. And so we're going to move on to, for tonight, we're going to move on to the second sutta in the Majima Nikaya, the middle, the middle length discourses. So tonight, this is going to be the Sabasana Sutta, the teaching or the sutra on all the taints. Now, the, I think the reason why I wanted to dive right into this sutta tonight is because last week we got to talking about asava, this idea of the taints. It came up. And it came up because we were talking about the arahat, this kind of early Buddhist idea of basically like an enlightened being. And one of, if not the defining characteristic of an arahat is that they are anashrava or anasava. They are without outflows. They don't have the taints. And so because we had already started talking about that idea of the taints and then what it would mean to be without the taints, I was excited to see that this next sutta in this collection is a sutra all about the taints. So I thought it would be a good um, uh, kind of samyutta, a good connection, a connecting between the suttas. So tonight what I wanna do, or the way that I would like to start tonight is I want to define a couple of words, primarily these taints that we're going to be talking about. But then this is such a great sutta that I want to kind of just read the sutta in its entirety. And then we'll have a conversation about like what's going on in the sutta. But it's one of those ones where I think it, you, you'll really benefit from just hearing the whole thing in that way. But in order to get the most out of this, in order to kind of get the most out of this reading, I want to prepare you in that way. I want to prepare you for what we're about to, to listen to. So the taints. So the first thing that I want to mention about the taints is this. Last week, I mentioned that there are these kind of three asava, asava, sorry, Three taints. Now, I describe them because of this literal term, meaning outflow. It can actually even mean a leakage, like you're leaking. And I talked about how the three taints, the three outflows, are sort of associated with tears, saliva, and sexual secretions, let's call it. Now, the thing about it is, is that those three, those three phenomena, tears, saliva, and secretions, those are not the three taints. They're related to the taints. And what I'm kind of getting at is this. You know how the Buddha describes greed, anger, and delusion as poisons. And there's a way in which they're not really poison, but they are. <laughs> My point is, is that when the Buddha talks about the taints, there are formally, officially three taints. And those three taints are Kama, Bahava, and avidya, kama, K-A-M-A, being sensual desire, sexual desire, 
The second, bahava, is existence. And the third, avidya, is ignorance. Now, those are technically, officially, formally, the three taints, the three asava. Now, the thing about it is, well, first of all, I want to talk about what those three sort of are pointing at. But even before we do that, the idea of a asava, a, a taint, the one thing that you should sort of know, even before I tell you what these three things are, you should keep in mind that the taints, they're kind of like the kleshas, by which I refer, I'm referring to the poisons that I just mentioned, the afflictions. But the three poisons, the three afflictions, the three kleshas, let's remember that that word klesha, it also means a kind of stain. Literally, the word klesha means like stained. That sounds similar to taint. And the idea is, is that they are very kind of similar except the three poisons, the three kleshas of greed, anger, and confusion, those are kind of considered manifest, active, conscious activities. Whereas the taints are considered deep, underlying, you could call them subconscious motivations for activity. Now, the thing about the taints, the taints are considered that which keeps cyclical rebirth going. The kleshas are kind of what keeps suffering going, like the anxiety, the stress all the time. But the reason why we keep coming back into the situation that we're in, this kind of cyclical existence, has more to do with these underlying tendencies. So that's the idea of the taints. They're like deep, deep-seated defilements that keep us trapped in samsara. So let's go back to the three taints real quick. The three taints are this kama, sensual desire. Now, I mentioned, of course, that Kama, K-A-M-A, is normally sexual desire. Because, you know, you've heard of the Kama Sutra, the, which is, of course, not a Buddhist sutra. Always need to remind everybody, not a Buddhist sutra. But the Kama Sutra is a discourse about sexuality or sexual uh, pleasure. So when we hear that the first taint is kama, we shouldn't ignore that it, it kind of is referencing sexuality. And if I were going to teach this sutra tonight, strictly from that kind of Theravada, early Buddhist perspective, I might lean a little bit more towards sexuality because, of course, the early Buddhist tradition was, you know, very monastic, very focused on celibacy. But because I don't really teach that kind of Buddhism, I always like to sort of remember, or I like to remind us that, sure, for some people, sexuality is the main desire. Like, that's like the, the, the peak of pleasure, the peak of desire is the pursuit of and fulfillment of sexuality. But there might be other people who, you know, whatever, maybe they like sexuality, maybe they like to masturbate or whatever, but drugs, ooh, I really, you know, okay, fine, then that's your desire, your come up. Or maybe you really want, you know, really like food to the point of craving for that sensual desire or that sensual pleasure. Then your kama, your sensual desire might be food. 
my point is, is that it's about sensuality, the senses. And that could go different for other uh, various people in that way. So that's the first one. And after I do the reading, we are going to, you know, obviously discuss this, but keep all of this in mind as I go through the reading. Now, the second of these is a, probably the trickiest. The second of the taints is Bahava. And already Bahava is a difficult word to translate. It gets translated a few different ways. I think in our sutta tonight, it is translated as being, which you can understand as existing, being. And ultimately, just to put it simply, the second taint is the desire for existence, the, the craving for existence, the craving for being. And if you want to kind of understand what the second taint is all about, all you have to look at is any fear you have of dying. That is your desire for existence. <laughs> you do not want to not exist. And that is this craving for desire. Now, even before we move any further forward, I want to make it very clear. Buddhism is, is of course, not advocating suicide or anything like that. Of, of course, we know that because the Buddha talks about avoiding self-gratification and self-mortification. That's the other end of that. So when the Buddha is talking about the desire or the craving for existence, to not do, to not crave for existence is not to crave non-existence. Like I, I want to make that very clear. The way that I understand it is it's about the kind of that the fear and the anxiety and the desperation involved in it that keeps us trapped in the cyclical process of existence and keeps suffering going. But again, I just want to kind of, <laughs> I just want to kind of put that out there for the reading. And then avidya, ignorance, the classic problem in Buddhism that we just don't quite get what's going on, right? We just don't quite understand. And then that ignorance is a taint that keeps us trapped in samsara, or keeps us trapped in cyclical existence. Okay, now those are the three taints, traditionally, technically. By the way, just to finish off that idea from last week, when the asava, when the taints are associated with tears, food, and sexual secretions, the associations are that sexual secretions are associated with kama, the sensual desire. Saliva is associated with bhava, existence, and like basically feeling that you have to eat or I'll die. And then tears is related to ignorance in terms of not understanding no self, not understanding emptiness. And so if you're crying about something, you don't get it in that way. So that's the way that my comment last week about the three literal outflows are associated with the three technical taints. All right. Everybody okay with all of that so far? But before I read this, I have one important thing to mention. Even though there are traditionally, technically, formally, these three taints, as we're going to see when I read through this, there's going to be a lot more than just three taints. And so before I get into this, I just want to remind everybody of one thing. A long time ago, several years ago now, 
I taught a sutta for Dharma doors, and it was a sutta called, I can't remember the Pali title. Yeah, I can't remember the Pali title. I can't even really remember what collection it was in. Yeah, sorry, I can't remember all that. But the sutta was called All the Feelings, <clears throat> All the Sensation, All the Vedana, right? And that, that sutta is really important. And it's important not just because of its teachings about Vedana, about sen sensations. I think that that sutta is so important for the study of Buddhism because it's in that sutta where basically the, the monks, the bhikkhus, they ask the Buddha, like, how many, how many Vedana are there? And the Buddha says, well, sometimes I teach that there's three Vedana, positive, negative, and neither positive nor negative. But sometimes I teach there's six Vedana, sensations of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and brain. But sometimes I teach there's 18 sensations, positive sensations of the eyes, negative sensations of the eyes, and neither positive nor negative sensations of the eyes. And so too with the ears, nose, tongue, body, and brain. But sometimes, so he keeps doing this. And another interesting thing about that sutta, it culminates with the teaching of 108 different types of sensations. The reason why I think that that sutta is so significant to the study of Buddhism is Buddhism, like, the kind of mind that is like, no, there's only three, and these are the three, period. Buddhism doesn't actually really encourage that type of mind that is so rigidly dogmatic. And so it's, I find that the teachings are, are always encouraging us to be a little more loose about all of these things. And basically like the Buddha, it's like, well, sometimes there's three, sometimes there's six, sometimes there's 18, sometimes there's 108. Thanks, Noam. Noam got the link to the sutta. So I say all of that to mention that, yes, traditionally, technically, formally, there's just three taints. But as I read through this, you're going to hear about a lot of other taints. And so we should kind of think about all of them as taints in that way. Okay, so let's kick back for a little bit. This is probably going to, I don't know how long this will take. It's not the longest sutta, but it's not short. So I'm going to read this and we're going to find out all about the taints. And then we'll have a discussion. So I would encourage anybody out there, if you'd like, if any part of this, you know, captures your attention or intrigues you or you have questions about, just take a little note. And then afterwards, we'll we'll visit any inquiries or comments or anything. So, all right. So once again, this is going to be the all the taints, the Sabasava Sutta, Sutta number two from the Majjhima Nikaya. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anattapindika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus! Venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied. And the blessed one said this. Bhikkhus, I shall teach you a discourse on the restraint of all the taints. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied. And the blessed one said this. Bhikkhus, I say that the destruction of the taints is for one who knows and sees, not for one who does not know and does not see. Who knows and sees what? Wise attention and unwise attention. 
when one attends wisely, when one attends unwisely, unarisen taints arise and arisen taints increase. When one attends wisely, unarisen taints do not arise and arisen taints are abandoned. Bhikkhus, there are some taints that should be abandoned by seeing, by seeing them. There are taints that should be abandoned by restraint. There are taints that should be abandoned by using. There are taints that should be abandoned by enduring. There are taints that should be abandoned by avoiding. There are taints that should be abandoned by removing. And there are taints that should be abandoned by developing. So, starting with the taints that are to be abandoned from darshana, from seeing them. What taints, bhikkhus, should be abandoned by seeing them? Here, bhikkhus, untaught ordinary people who have no regard for the noble ones and are unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma, who have no regard for true people and are unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma, they don't understand what things are fit for attention and what things are unfit for attention. Since that is so, they attend to those things that are unfit for attention, and they do not attend to those things that are fit for attention. What are the things unfit for attention that, that they attend to? They are things such that when one attends to them, the unarisen taint of sensual desire arises, and the arisen taint of sensual desire increases. The unarisen taint of bhava, being, arises, and the arisen taint of being increases. The unarisen taint of ignorance arises, and the arisen taint of ignorance increases. These are the things unfit for attention that they attend to. And what are the things that are fit for attention that they do not attend to? They are things such that when one attends to them, the unarisen taint of sensual desire does not arise, and the arisen taint of sensual desire is abandoned. The unarisen taint of being does not arise, and the arisen taint of being is abandoned. And they are things such that, when attended to, the unarisen taint of ignorance does not arise, and the arisen taint of ignorance is abandoned. These are the things that are fit for attention that they don't attend to. By attending to things unfit for attention, and by not attending to things fit for attention, both unarisen taints arise and arisen taints increase. And this is how they attend unwisely, bhikkhus. They think, was I in the past? Was I not in the past? What was I in the past? How was I in the past? Having been what? What did I become in the past? <gasps> Shall I be in the future? Shall I not be in the future? What shall I be in the future? How shall I be in the future? Having been what, what shall I become in the future? Or else they 
are inwardly, inwardly perplexed about the present, thinking thus, am I? Am I not? What am I? How am I? Where has this being come from? Where will it go? When one attends unwisely in that way, one of six views arise. The view, the self exists for me, arises as true and established. Or the view, no self exists for me, arises as true and established. Or the view, I perceive self with self, arises as true and established. Or the view, I perceive that which is not self with self, that arises as true and established. Or the view, I perceive that which is self with not self, that arises in them as true and established. Or else they have come to such a view as this. It is this self of mind that speaks and feels and experiences here and now or here and there the result of good and bad actions. But this self of mind is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and it will endure as long as eternity. These speculative views, bhikkhus, this is called the thicket of views, the wilderness of views, the contortion of views, the vacillation of views, the fetter of views. Fettered by the fetter of views, untaught ordinary people are not freed from birth. They're not freed from aging and death. They're not freed from sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. They're not freed from suffering, I say. Bhikkhus. Well-taught noble disciples who have regard for noble ones and are skilled and disciplined in their dharma, who have regard for true people and are skilled and disciplined in their dharma, they understand what things are fit for attention, and they understand what things are unfit for attention. Since that is so, they do not attend to those things that are unfit for attention, and they attend to those things that are fit for attention. What are those things unfit for attention that they do not attend to? They are things such that when one attends to them, the unarisen taint of sensual desire arises and the arisen taint of sensual desire increases. And the unarisen taint of being arises and the arisen taint of being increases and the unarisen taint of ignorance arises and the arisen taint of ignorance increases. These are the kinds of things unfit for attention that the noble disciples don't attend to. And what are the things that are fit for attention that they do attend to? They are things such that when they attend to them, the unarisen taint of sensual desire does not arise. And the arisen taint of sensual desire is abandoned. The unarisen taint of being does not arise and any arisen taint of being is abandoned. And the unarisen taint of ignorance does not arise and any arisen taint of ignorance is abandoned. These are the things that are fit for attention that the noble disciples attend to. By not attending to things unfit for attention and by attending to things that are fit for attention, unarisen taints don't arise and arisen taints are abandoned. And one attends wisely because this is suffering. One attends wisely. This is the origin of suffering. One attends wisely. This is the cessation of suffering. One attends wisely. 
This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. When one attends wisely in this way, three fetters are abandoned. The view of a personality, doubt, and adherence to rules and observances. These are called the taints that should be abandoned by darshana, by seeing. And what taints bhikkhus should be abandoned by restraining? Here, a bhikkhu reflecting wisely abides with the eye faculty restrained. Now, while taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who abides with the eye faculty unrestrained, there are no taints, vexation, or fever in one who abides with the eye faculty restrained. Reflecting wisely, one abides with the ear faculty restrained. While taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who abides with the ear faculty unrestrained, with the with one who abides with the ear faculty restrained, sorry, there are no taints, vexation, or fever in one who abides with the ear faculty restrained. Reflecting wisely, one abides with the nose faculty restrained. While taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who abides with the nose faculty unrestrained, there are no taints, vexation, or fever in one who abides with the nose faculty restrained. Reflecting wisely, one abides with the tongue faculty restrained. While taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who abides with the tongue faculty unrestrained, there's no taints, vexation, or fever in one who abides with the tongue faculty restrained. Reflecting wisely, one abides with the body faculty restrained. While taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who abides with the body faculty unrestrained, there are no taints, vexation, or fever in one who abides with the body faculty restrained. And reflecting, reflecting wisely, one abides with the mind faculty restrained. While taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who abides with the mind faculty unrestrained, there's no taints, no vexation or fever in one who abides with the mind faculty restrained. While taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who abides with their faculties unrestrained, there are no taints, vexation or fever in one who abides with the faculties restrained. These are called the taints that should be abandoned by restraining. What taints bhikkhus should be abandoned by using? Here, a bhikkhu reflecting wisely uses their clothing or uses the robe only for protection from cold, for protection from heat, for protection from contact with gadflies, mosquitoes, wind, the sun, and creeping things, and only for the purpose of concealing their private parts. Reflecting wisely, they use food, they use alms food, neither for amusement nor for intoxication, nor for the sake of phys physical beauty and attractiveness, but only for the endurance and continuance of the body, for ending discomfort and for assisting the holy life. Considering, thus I shall terminate old feelings without arousing new feelings, and I shall be healthy and blameless and shall live in comfort. Reflecting wisely, they use a resting place or a home only for protection from cold, for protection from heat, for protection from contact with gadflies, mosquitoes, wind, the sun, and creeping things, and only for the purpose of warding off the perils of the climate and for enjoying retreat. Reflecting wisely, 
They use medicine only for protection from arisen afflicting feelings and for the benefit of good health. Now, while taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who does not use these four requisites like this in that way, there are no taints, no vexation or fever in one who uses them thus. These are called the taints that should be abandoned by using. And what taints, bhikkhus, should be abandoned by enduring? Here, bhikkhus, reflecting wisely, bhikkhus bear cold and heat. They bear hunger and thirst. They bear contact with gadflies, mosquitoes, wind, the sun, and creeping things. They endure ill-spoken, unwelcome words and arisen bodily feelings that are painful, racking, sharp, piercing, disagreeable, distressing, and menacing to life. While taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who does not endure such things, there are no taints, no vexation or fever in one who endures them. These are called the taints that should be abandoned by enduring. And what taints, bhikkhus, should be abandoned by avoiding? Here, bhikkhus reflecting wisely, avoid wild elephants. They avoid wild horses, wild bulls, wild dogs, snakes, tree stumps, brambles, chasms, cliffs, cesspits, and sewers. Reflecting wisely, they avoid sitting on unsuitable seats, wandering to unsuitable resorts, and associating with bad friends, since if they were to do so, wise companions in the holy life might suspect them of doing evil. Now, while taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who does not avoid these things, there are no taints, no vexation and fever in one who avoids them. These are called the taints that should be abandoned by avoiding. And what taints, bhikkhus, should be abandoned by removing? Here, bhikkhus reflecting wisely, they do not tolerate an arisen thought of kama, sensual desire. They abandon it, remove it, do away with it, annihilate it. They do not tolerate an arisen thought of ill will. They abandon it, remove it, do away with it, annihilate it. They do not tolerate an arisen thought of cruelty. They do away with it, abandon it, remove it, they annihilate it. They do not tolerate arisen, evil, unwholesome states. They abandon them, remove them, do away with them, and annihilate them. While taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who does not remove those thoughts, there are no taints, no vexation or fever in one who removes them. These are called the taints that should be abandoned by removing. And what taints, bhikkhus, should be abandoned by bhavana, by developing? Here, bhikkhus reflecting wisely, develop the mindfulness factor of enlightenment, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. They develop the investigation of dharma's factor of enlightenment, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. They develop the energy, the virya factor of enlightenment, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. They develop the rapture or pretty, pity factor of enlightenment, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. They develop the tranquility factor of enlightenment, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. They develop the samadhi 
factor of enlightenment, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. And they develop the equanimity factor of enlightenment, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. While taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who does not develop these factors of enlightenment, there are no taints, no vexation or fever in one who develops them. These are called the taints that should be abandoned by developing. Bhikkhus. When, for a bhikkhu, the taints that should be abandoned by seeing have been abandoned by seeing, when the taints that should be abandoned by restraining have been abandoned by restraining, when the taints that should be abandoned by using have been abandoned by using, when the taints that should be abandoned by enduring have been abandoned by enduring, when the taints that should be abandoned by avoiding have been abandoned by avoiding, when the taints that should be abandoned by removing have been abandoned by removing, and when the taints that should be abandoned by developing have been abandoned by developing. Then, they are called a bhikkhu who dwells restrained with the restraint of all the taints. They have severed all craving, flung off the fetters, and with the complete penetration of the conceit, I am, they make an end of suffering. At least that's what the Blessed One said, and the bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Okay, so thank you for your patience in that reading. So let's go back to the beginning. So we've got these taints and we are going to uh, pahattaba to abandon. Pahattaba is this word for abandon these asava. So we want to abandon these taints. And the Buddha tells us that there's taints that we can abandon by seeing, taints that we can abandon by restraining, using, enduring, avoiding, removing, and finally by developing. So those are our six sections. So let's just start with the first, all of the taints that are being to be abandoned by seeing. So the Buddha mentions this idea of, um, oh, actually, even before that, in the summary section, so if you have the, the Wisdom Publication Edition, in the summary section, it says that, or the Buddha says that the destruction of the taints is for one who knows and sees, not for one who does not know and does not see. Who knows and sees what? Wise attention versus unwise attention. And the word for attention is manaskara. So manaskara is this idea of attention. And if you know your Pali or your Sanskrit, you kind of can probably piece together what that word is. We got one part manas, mine, and one part skritta. Skritta is like to make, to fabricate in that way. So attention is this kind of mind, not fabrication, I wouldn't say, but that kind of mind work, manaskara. And there's wise manaskara and unwise. So that's kind of the first thing is about this attending. Marnie, what you got? I see you. Let's see. There we go. Hey, Hi. good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. As always, totally awesome to hear you explain these. But I do have just a couple of questions. Rocket. So the first one is about removing. Um, and it's about, you know, any unwholesome states, you know, anything like that, even thoughts about this, obviously. Um, but now isn't it thought that, I guess, with multiple turning of the wheels, that 
it's better to like go through them. Like I'll just use a quick example. Um, you know, somebody's husband cheats and I know, but I don't want to tell because I don't want to get in the middle of it. Um, so I'm abandoning it, but in mm. without thinking about it and letting it go or with instead I should think it through and be like, I don't want to get in the middle of it because that's my friend. You know what? I, I should work with those emotions mm. instead of just removing it, perhaps, is what my question is. And maybe that's not the best example, but what I mean, we could even use passion if I, you know, have desire someone. Sure. Should I think that through? But anyway, so that's my first question. Mm-hmm. And then the second one, um, by developing, it talks about all these enlightenment factors. And again, I think it's you're going to say the same thing, but where's compassion? Where, like, when I think of enlightenment factors, this is a beautiful list, but I mean, where's, where's compassion? <laughs> yep. Um, two excellent questions, Marnie. Um, yeah, so let's deal with the first one because I feel like the first one is sort of a very, um, it's sort of overarching this whole sutta in that way. So the, so Marnie's question is sort of, you know, she, she mentions this idea of the turnings of the Dharma wheel, which of course, if you come to Dharma doors, you know about, we sort of talk about it in terms of like, early Buddhism, mainstream Mahayana Buddhism, and Vajrayana Buddhism. That's like normally the way that I would, you know, talk about them. Those are the kind of three turnings of the wheel. And let's just take, Marnie, for, let's just take, as as you mentioned, let's take the kind of this simple idea of kama, of this kind of sensual desire, whether it be sexual or otherwise, sort of doesn't really matter in that way. So that particular emotion appears twice in our list. It appears as one of the taints, like one of the three taints. The first one is sensual desire, comma. But then in the section that Marnie referenced, the section on removing it comes up as part of a list in terms of sensual desire, ill will, cruelty, and general evil, evil, unwholesome states, right? So, so Marty again mentioned the idea of like, in the Vajrayana, for example, isn't there a kind of a different approach to sensuality and sensual you know sensual experience in that way there is and so let's kind of remember and i know marnie i know you didn't not know this but let's remember that this is a sutta from that early period of buddhism that was very focused on renunciation i would say and renunciation uh writ large meaning this sutta represents that early Buddhist tradition that was about renouncing family, sexuality, the world, jo- everything. So it was it was about renunciation. And certainly, kama, sensuality or sensual desire, is something to be renounced, like go of in that way. Now, One of the things that I want to make clear is that as far as I'm concerned, all forms of Buddhism are encouraging us to get rid of kama, to get rid of this sensual desire. And by the way, I know I don't have to do this, but I want to do it. (laughs) For me, when I, as I practice the Dharma, as I teach it, When we're talking about sensual desire, we're talking about, or I'm talking about, I'm thinking about the the mind state that thinks I would be so much happier if I was 
engaged in some sensual thing that I would want to do. So it's about the wanting or the desiring of that, the, the craving of that. And in particular, what we want to think about is, let, let me just, I'm going to choose a, like a really simple, benign example. Let's go back to someone who is more interested in, let's say, food than sexuality or anything else. It's the idea that like, there's a particular food that I want to eat. You know, like maybe there's some restaurant that I really want to go to. And the idea is, is that there's a desire for that. And now there's a lot of problems because what if, you know, they don't have a reservation or what if they're closed or what if I can't get there? And so I'm sitting here with this desire for that but I can't have it. And there's a mentality where no other food will do. <laughs> I need to have that. And so what I want to focus on tonight, or what I would like us to stay focused on, is that craving, that wanting, the desiring. Let's avoid vilifying the sexual act Let's avoid vilifying eating. I don't want to do that. Let's avoid vilifying sensuality. But let's put the spotlight on this craving for it and say that's the problem in that way. So all forms of Buddhism, Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana, they would all like us to not be in that compromised position of the craving and therefore suffering. So we kind of then have these three different vehicles. They're called vehicles because they kind of lead us to that abandonment or relinquishment, choose your verb. Now in the early form of Buddhism, which we often, you know, in Dharma doors, I often mention that the early form of Buddhism, much more stoic, much more kind of hardcore in that way. And so the early school of Buddhism was like, just stop. <laughs> just stop. <laughs> like, wh what's your problem? It's in the Mahayana and the Vajrayana that we start to develop what will become known as upaya, right? Upaya, skillful or expedient means. And so that idea of upaya, Marni, eventually gets fully developed in the Vajrayana where there are techniques and methods for, you know, I always describe it as rather than avoiding the desire, there's a way of going through the desire. It's almost like leaning into the desire to go all the way past it. But don't forget, this is just an expedient for eventually letting it go in that way. So what, kind of what I want to get around to is that there's still plenty for us to learn from this sutta because the end result is going to be the same. Uh, the end result, of course, being severing craving, flinging off the fetters, and completely penetrating the delusional conceit that I am, thus making an end of suffering. All forms of Buddhism, I believe, are trying to lead us to severing craving, flinging off the fetters, completely penetrating the delusional conceit I am, and making an end of suffering. Tonight, Marnie, we will not be talking, or I won't be talking about that Vajrayana approach of sort of working with these desires. But I just want to make that strong point, though, that the, the end result or the end goal is the same in that way. Now, your question about compassion is almost kind of exactly the same answer in the sense that this particular sutta comes from that early tradition. And that early Buddhist tradition that you know, we sometimes refer to it as the Hinayana. 
Well, it is also sometimes referred to as the path of individual liberation, meaning my liberation. And it's not, despite what some people may kind of teach or say, the early Buddhist tradition is not not compassionate. It's just that the focus is very much on individual liberation in that way. And it's considered beneficial for all beings that I get liberated. Like that is a kind of a tacit understanding in Buddhism that it is of great benefit to everybody if I work out my stuff. Like if I get my mind right, that's going to help everybody. So there's a kind of implied tacit compassion to all of this. But yes, Marnie, this is a sutta from that early tradition. It is not a bodhisattva path sutta or sutra. So it's not going to be emphasizing the practice of compassion as a practice in that way. So the seven factors of enlightenment that are listed are, of course, the traditional seven factors of enlightenment that are entirely about one's own individual liberation. So, awesome. Any other questions, comments, or ideas about the reading or from the reading? Yeah, Noe. Yes, thank you, Michael. Yes, the the vexation and the fever mm -hmm. and the, and the craving it really resonates with me around the lines which we've been talking about of, of addiction, addiction. Yeah, it's like Perfect. oh yes, there's the there it is. You know, uh, how do I get away? From, you know, I mean, in my moment of desperation was desperation. I have to stop this in, in my struggles, um, and and. And it is my struggle. So I appreciate that. It turns inward. It's my fixations, my fevers, my cravings. And I also appreciate that the Buddha was speaking to, you know, one or 2,000 14-year-old boys <laughs> and girls who had to really, you know, they had to have guidance. They had to have a strict rule. But I so appreciate the the way this sutra said it at the end there it's that you know and one who while pains fixations and fever might arise uh in 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 one who does not remove the thoughts and one that does remove the thought there are no fevers there's no fixation there is that but again it's like but when it where is that oh but it's right now oh how about now Oh, and if I may, I, in my meditation, I watch these thoughts come up. I watch this idea come up, and then I observe the physical reaction within my body. I'm paying attention. It's like, oh, there's a, there's a, an interesting thought, and then I'm paying attention that my body is responding to that thought. But fortunately, then I just watch it go away. And something else comes up. So this is a good, I appreciate this uh, this teaching today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Noe. Actually, based on what Noe just said, let's, um, let's do, let's have a little uh, kind of experiment. Not an experiment, but let's do this. So... I want to focus on the first section about abandoning the taints by seeing, darshan or darshana. And you may recognize the formula that was presented in here because it's the same formula as what is known as the four right efforts. And so I want to work with that formula and I want to use what Noe mentioned. So Noe, I appreciate everything you said, and I want to use kind of one thing you mentioned. So let's think about addiction. Let's use that as an example. I think it's a, I think it's a very appropriate example to use because I think anybody who 
suffers from addiction, has suffered from addiction. And I think there's a way in which we all have to one degree or another of something. I think we can all understand and appreciate what it means for there to be an arising of sensual desire or kama. And remember, I'm not talking about sexuality. I'm talking about whatever it might be. And so we're going to focus on the idea of either getting inebriated or getting high or getting twisted or you know, whatever adjective you like to use. But we want to notice that, or what we can notice is that there is sort of things that we can be engaged with or engaged in viewing, seeing, attending to, manaskara. And there's, well, let's, let's focus on this idea of, or let me create a hypothetical scenario. And the hypothetical scenario is that I am not particularly thinking about my desired ad addiction or the thing that I'm addicted to, right? So I'm like, um, I, my mind's on something else. But there's something I might see that'll spark and basically make me want to have a drink or make me want to do that. And now that's the arising of that craving or that desire. And it wasn't there a moment ago, but it has creeped up. That is this idea of the arising that they're talking about. And again, we all know what this is like. Of, and again, whether it's sexuality or addiction or what have you, we know what it's like to not be. And then the arising of that and the craving of it. So then that puts us in this, in the formula. And the formula is about when there has been this when, or when there is already the craving, the arising of the craving, they're not being that craving, and then the abandonment of that craving. So those are the kind of the four aspects of this. And what I really like about this sutta, it's what I love about Buddhism. So what are the things that we should... I want to get the language right, right? So yeah, what are the things fit and unfit for attention? And notice that it doesn't say explicitly like, um, you know, whatever. Um, you know, it doesn't say an actual thing that we need to not look at or look at. What is it that we should, again, um, what is it that's unfit for attention? Well, whatever causes that addictive craving to arise. <laughs> and what is it that is fit for attention? That which doesn't cause that to arise. So what I'm thinking about is, I'm thinking about, and you know, I don't want to get puritanical about this. I don't want to sound that way. But what I'm thinking about is, Let's say that you are struggling with addiction to a substance and you go to put on a, a movie and the, the, the warning label pops up and it's like, this movie's rated R due to depictions of substance abuse. Would that be something that's fit for attending? Notice that that would probably be something that because there's going to be people in the movie using, that's probably going to plant a seed in my mind and give rise to the craving for me to use in that way. Now, again, I'm not trying to sound puritanical. I'm not, I really am not. I'm, this is about, and remember, it's the beautiful language that they use, skillful unskillful. It is not super skillful for someone who has, say, uh, you know, a, a, uh, is struggling with alcohol addiction. It's probably not skillful for them to go hang out in bars. Now, again, I'm not trying to be puritanical about it, but this is about 
knowing ourselves. And it's why, again, it's why I love that the sutra doesn't say explicitly what you should and shouldn't attend to. You should know what is going to cause the arising and what is not. And then you know what to attend to and what not to attend to in that way. I think this is really, it's really nice in, for that way because it doesn't, you know, it's not a one size fits all teaching in that sense. So, so that's that first part about seeing and properly or skillfully attending. I used the example of kind of addiction to substitute or stand for the comma, right? And I think probably all understand how that works, right? But then of course, we are also talking not just about the kind of the craving for sensuality, but we are also talking about this bahava and this avidya. So the ignorance and the existence one as well. Any questions about those? I don't want to move too fast through them, but I also don't want to dwell too long on them if everybody already kind of understands those. The only thing that I want to add to this, and this is because I know that, you know, there's a lot of... Um, serious Dharma students out there tonight. I know that. So one of the things that I would love for us to just notice, so this is just a quick aside, like a parenthetical aside. These three technical, traditional, formal taints, the Kama, Bhava, Avidya. One of the things that I would like us to notice is that each of those is basically part of the 12 link chain of dependent origination. In particular, the 12 link chain of dependent origination begins with avidya, ignorance. But if you study Mahayana Buddhist philosophy, if you study Nagarjuna in particular, then you know he was particularly focused on the bahava, link in the 12 link chain of, of existence. So the, the being or bhava existence link in the chain. And of course, all of Nagarjuna's thought, like if you study Nagarjuna, his whole philosophy can be reduced to one word, nisvabhava, no inherent bhava. It basically, there's no bhava. And what I want you to notice is that this whole sutta that we've read is about abandoning the taint of bhava. So there is no break in the Dharma between the early form of Buddhism and Nagarjuna. Everybody is talking about abandoning this kind of idea or notion or craving for existing or existence in that way. And of course, desire or tanha, it's tanha or craving in the 12 link chain, but it's basically that kind of kama sensual desire. So just wanted to show you how those kind of link together. Okay, so then that brings us to the second part, which was about restraint. Another tricky word, samvara, samvara is the Pali, but this idea of restraining the sense faculties, restraining the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and brain. Now, there's this is definitely a place where depending on the type of Buddhism you're practicing, restraint will take on a different meaning. In some schools of Buddhism, especially the early schools of Buddhism, restraint, it like restraining the eyes, it meant this. Closing the eyes. <laughs> Notice how it's hard to get excited about visual things when you can't see them. So there was an 
you know, in early Buddhism, there are a lot of practices of what I would call sensory deprivation, depriving the body of sensual stimuli. That is one way to understand what it means to restrain the senses, is to just literally shut them off. There's another way of understanding restraining the senses, and what that is, is it would be a kind of more very passive attending without getting worked up at all. So in other words, normally we are distractible and there's a way in which the mind loves to cling and, and glom on to things. And what that means is that if I were sitting in meditation and like the sound of an ambulance were to go by, my mind would be disturbed by it and would latch on to it as the sound of an ambulance. And that would be unrestrained. Whereas if there was just a more passive observing of the sound, almost without ascribing it the meaning of being an ambulance, but de definitely not ascribing the meaning of like emergency, emergency, somebody's in danger, but just a sound that could also be restraint in that way. Those are kind of two, you know, simple ways of thinking about restraint, but we are talking about, or at least the second section, the taints that are abandoned by restraint is primarily talking about controlling the senses and that control can go like to like an extreme degree of shutting them off to a more kind of passive mode of them just not being activated in that way so any questions about abandoning tates by restraint yeah no Um, thinking about like the difference between the, you know, shutting the eyes and uh, restraining the response to the stimulus instead of just cutting it out, you know, and, and how that is, I'm thinking about like a Mahayana versus a, a Theravada kind of approach and how that's m more leaning into a wisdom of I mean, it's it's a little circular, like, you know, the, you know, seeing that an ambulance sound is just a sound is is a source of wisdom, but also if you have the wisdom to apply to it, you can see it as just, a, or perceive it as just a sound versus an emergency emergency. Mm -hmm. Ver versus the Theravadan, like, I'm just going to go into a cave, you know, and sure. just, like, in some ways, it's, it, it doesn't lean on the wisdom. Mm. As much. It is the, the Mahayana critique of early Buddhism. Right? It's not really a critique, but the Mahayana basically says like, yeah, the Buddha taught that for like kind of children. Like, you know, and but taught the Mahayana for the adults in that way. So at least that's what the Mahayana likes to say. So um, Marnie, you had a question and then I think there was another one, but take Marnie's question first. Hi, so, okay. One thing that's really standing out to me is the black and white, right and wrong, very dualistic thinking throughout this entire sutta. And I know it mentions, you know, no self basically, um, or, you know, that's one of the main teachings, right? Uh, so I'm just kind of really confused because it seems like that's not, I, why is that not being approached at all in this? It is. But I, I think I want to, I'll need to show you where because it's not super explicit. So what we kind of, excellent question again, Marty, by the way. So I think what we need to notice is, is this, 
So how can I, let me give me one moment. So what we want to notice or think about is this. So I'm going to focus on, I'm going to focus on uh, comma again, sensuality, sensual desire again, but just as an easy go-to. What we want to notice is if I'm, if one, if I'm in a mind state that is um, desirous, as the Buddhists would say, so full of kama, full of sensual desire, if that's my mind state, and, and let's just make this really easy and say that it's a mind state that is actual like kama, like sexual desire. That mind state is now going to be basically looking at everybody and going beautiful, ugly, beautiful, ugly, and separating everybody into attractive, meaning they'll satisfy my sexual desire. They'll definitely satisfy my sexual desire. Those people, though, are ugly and will not satisfy my sexual desire. That's dualistic. To not do that is equanimous. And I wouldn't go so far as to say non-dual, but it is equanimous. But that's where they want, they're not going to say that explicitly. But that's where you got, we need to sort of look at the very nature of sensual desire. It's dualistic or hierarchical. And then if we were to approach the other taint of ignorance, which is about the conceit of I am, that is very much about the duality of self and other. And so to, uh, what's the language again? To completely penetrate that conceit of the self, that again is non-dual and equanimous. Is that sort of? Yeah, and then for the bhava, is that is this prior to the teachings on impermanence then as well? Oh no, this is squarely within the teaching of impermanence. The so thing... this would be ignorance to impermanence then. I'm sorry. Uh, say your kind of thinking again. Your your. So that would be basically ignorance to impermanence. What like would be? they're they're refusing like by. By being attached to being, they're basically refusing the impermanence or, oh. or they're choosing to be ignorant to it. Excellent. Excellent. I finally got it finally penetrated. Well, and I was thinking if I'm ignorant to impermanence, then I'm sex, drugs and rock and roll. I, so no wonder I'd have to go live in a cave. <laughs> in this tradition. Yes. Okay. The one thing about bhava. Bhava is also dualistic and very dualistic because it is the duality of existing and non-existing. And this is what I was saying about that for the noble disciple to abandon the taint of existence, that does not mean non-existence. It actually means outside of the paradigm, the dualistic paradigm of existence, non-existence. So. <laughs> okay. Noe, I think Noe had a question or a comment or an idea. Thanks again, Marty, by the, by the way, great questions. Great question. Thank you, Mari. And yeah, it just, it is, it is the, the, the period because I can close my eyes, but I still see. <laughs> I can go live in a cave, but I still have desires. I still am in this. Uh, there, there's still, uh, you know, these taints are, are you know, that that are, are are arising, and I have to examine them, and I examine them, and I have a choice at that point of of of, of yeah. 
just leave mm -hmm. it at that. Thank you. And on that note, Noe, by the way, and this was this is going to go for both the section on seeing and the section on restraint. Um, it's sort of we want to. Um, well, actually, I'm I'm not even going to go down that road. I, I realized I was about to back back us way back and repeat a bunch of stuff we've already talked about. So, good comment, Noe. Okay, any other? All right, so I just wanted to kind of quickly then mention a few things about the other sections. So we dealt with the section on seeing, we dealt with the section on restraint or restraining. The next section is about the taints that are abandoned by using. And then using of, is of course about how you use, how one uses clothing, food, a house, and medicine. The four requisites, they are called. And so you'll notice when I did the reading, or, you know, so it talks about robes, but I definitely think that for the householder, kind of bodhisattva path, we can think about just clothing, not robes. It talks about alms food, but I think the same thing goes for food in general. It talks about a resting place, but that could be where you rest. And the last one is medicine. Important thing to talk about in that way, because the Buddhists are not, uh, they're not Christian scientists. <laughs> they do not believe in faith healing in that way. They do believe in medicine. Early Buddhism, very, very early Buddhism, you were only allowed to use honey Honey was the only allowable medicine. As Buddhism developed and changed, that changes though. But otherwise, we're just sort of being mindful about the way we're using clothing, the way we're using food, the way we're using a dwelling place, and the way we're using medicine. And just sort of notice that the Buddha sets up that there are ways of using those four things, that create vexation and fever. And there's ways of using those things that don't create vexation and fever. And as with all of the Dharma, with all of these teachings, I would never, ever, ever encourage anybody to just follow this blindly. I would encourage everybody to think about this. <laughs> Meaning think about the idea. So what does it say about, you know, clothing, right? Um, or actually it was the one about, um, I guess it, oh, it was the food one. Right. So not for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness, right? Just give it some thought for one moment let's think about the idea of clothing and the idea of dressing for attractiveness. Again, let's just look at it. If I'm dressing in order to be perceived as attractive, aren't I just setting myself up for suffering and vexation in terms of somebody insulting what I'm wearing? And then I'm going to be like, ah, oh, but I put so much work into my outfit to be attractive. And this person's telling me I'm not attractive. Just notice that we are set, you, one sets themselves up for vexation in that, in that way. Just notice it and then choose whether you want to be setting yourself up for vexation or not. In that sense. All right. Now. I did want to mention this. I'm glad that we got to this point. So I actually think that this is kind of funny, but I think a lot of Buddhism is funny in that way. But notice that in the section on using, it talks about in terms of our clothing and in terms of our housing, that we only use clothing and housing in order to protect ourselves from cold and heat contact with gadflies, mosquitoes, wind, sun, and creeping things. But then when it comes to enduring, it says, oh yeah, and the bhikkhu 
endures being cold, being hot, being in contact with gadflies and creeping things and all of that. Now, you know, I mean, I guess we're getting towards the end of the evening now. I I will, I'll share a, a one anecdote. This is a personal anecdote. It, it's sort of a, a very personal moment in my life, sort of from my, um, my, my cultivation. And what it was is, so this would have been in 2005, and I had been living in Taiwan in a monastery. It was one of the first times I'd done um, long-term retreat, like many months in meditative retreat. And so I was really learning at that point, like really learning to meditate deeply for long periods of time. I never really had done that. After I left the monastery, I just sort of backpacked around Taiwan for a couple of weeks. And I wound up going pretty deep into the mountains for a while. And I wound up going really deep in the woods one day and sitting under a tree to meditate as you know, the Buddhist tradition would encourage us to do in that way. And it happened to be my birthday, not that that's really relevant, but my experience was that I was sitting in meditation and I had gone pretty deep into that meditation. And when I kind of came back into kind of awareness, I realized that I was covered in bugs. And I mean, covered in bugs. But I had this amazing realization. I realized they don't mean me any harm. They're just checking me out. And I relaxed into being covered with gadflies and mosquitoes. You know, but I, I relaxed into that. And it was one of the most beautiful meditations. And this is after I had done a deep, deep meditation and realized I was covered in bugs and then went on a deeper meditation. And I feel like kind of what I had done at that moment was abandon this taint in that way. And I was enduring being covered in bugs and it was great. <laughs> so that's my one little personal uh, anecdote about enduring in that way. <laughs> so All right. So I don't think we'll do another night on this, even though I didn't get to talk about all the sections. I feel like we address them one way or another. So if you were really hoping to find out more about those last sections, but it, with Marnie's great questions, I felt like we dealt a little bit with the, with the removing and the seven factors of enlightenment. So I feel like we covered it. So Oh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, that's it for me.